Thank you very much for the kind introduction. So I will talk about uh, how to tackle electronic correlations in rare earth compounds. So here I have first a brief outline of my talk. So I will very briefly introduce the methods that I'm using, which are mainly uh, combined density functional and dynamic mean field theory. And then I will show uh, two applications involving uh, rare earth elements. The first one is a study of um, new inorganic pigment materials, more specifically uh, rare earth fluorosulfides. And the second application is a study of um, rare earth magnetism in cerium-based permanent magnets. Yes, yeah, so I also start with the, with the Hubbard model, but with the multi-orbital Hubbard model in three dimensions. So just to recall very briefly in the Hubbard model, we have electrons that can hop from lattice side to lattice side with the hopping amplitude T. And uh, when they are on the same lattice side, they interact through local Coulomb interaction U. So the Hubbard model has uh, two terms, a kinetic energy term or one electron part and a Coulomb interaction term. And they, inter they compete with each other. And since I uh, want to do realistic material calculations, usually I, I need multiple orbitals. So the LM prime, ML prime uh, indices here, they are orbital indices. And for the rare earth compounds that I'm going to address, we are mostly interested in the strongly correlated rare earth 4F orbitals that you can see here. And in order to solve or better approximate the Hubbard model, the method that I'm using is dynamical mean field theory DMFT. And what DMFT basically does, uh, it maps the Hubbard model self-consistently onto a single impurity model. And in the single impurity model, we have only one impurity with the local Coulomb interaction U. And this impurity is coupled uh, to a mean field uh, in space, which represents the rest of the solid. And if one wants to do material calculations with a DMFD, one can combine it with a density functional theory. So this is this DFD plus DMFD approach. And in that case, one can extract uh, the one electron part of the Hubbard Hamiltonian from DFD and also uh, the local Coulomb interaction U, one can uh, calculate from first principles. Yeah, that's basically already everything that I wanted to show in this very brief introduction to the methods. Now I directly want to jump into this first application, uh, which is an investigation of the rare earth fluorosulfides, LNSF, where LN is a rare earth element, like cerium, prosodinium, neodymium, samarium. And these materials, they are interesting uh, as new pigment materials because they show very brilliant colors. Uh, for example, the yellow pigment here, this is samarium fluorosulfide while the red one is um, cerium fluorosulfide. And my goal was uh, to calculate their optical properties, in particular, the, the optical gap and the optical conductivity from first principles. And the challenge thereby is uh, twofold, because in these materials, we don't only have uh, strongly correlated rare earth for F states, which lead to the formation of a MOT gap, but at the same time, we also have a PD band gap which is also not well described in DFT. So if you do a standard DFT calculation in the local density approximation, for example, for samarium fluorosulfide, uh, this is what you get for the density of states. So we have this uh, pronounced very sharp uh, samarium 4F peak at the Fermi energy, which is clearly not correct because these materials, they are not metals. And this, uh, but this we can resolve by using DMFT because DMFT can account uh, for the strong correlation effects in the rare earth for F shell, which will open the MOT gap. But then we are still left with the problem of the PD gap. And with that, I mean the gap between the sulfur 3P states in blue here and the samarium uh, 5D states. So this gap here. And this um, semiconducting gap is known to be underestimated in LDA. And in order to tackle this challenge, one could do, uh, uh, one need, basically one mainly needs to include a non-local exchange. And for that one could do a GW calculation, but one can also do something a bit uh, simpler. One can employ a non-local 
exchange correlation functional in DFT. And that is what I did. And what I used is the modified Becky Johnson potential as it is implemented in the V2K program package. So I have introduced this uh, new MBJ plus DMFT approach, which works very well for this class of materials. So here you can see in the plots, the calculated uh, spectral functions. So for prosodinium fluorosulfide, neodymium fluorosulfide, uh, samarium fluorosulfide and gadolinium fluorosulfide. In, uh, so in red, it is the, the rare earth for F states. And now due to the strong Coulomb interaction, which is considered in the in DMFT, uh, the F states, they're split into lower and upper Hubbard band with the MOT gap in between. And then we further have the fluorine 2P states in blue, uh, the sulfur 3P states in green and the rare earth uh, 5P states in orange. And the solid black lines in the plots here, uh, they represent uh, experimental XPS spectra uh, from my collaborator, Alan de Mourc. And you can see, uh, that the peak positions between theory and experiment, they agree pretty well. So for example, for prosodinium fluorosulfide here. Yeah. But in order to see the optical gaps, it is better to look at the, the k resolved spectral functions that you can see here, again, for prosodinium, neodymium, samarium, and gadolinium fluorosulfide. And from that, we can directly read off the direct optical gap, which is indicated by the red arrows in the plots here. But in addition, we can also identify uh, which states are involved in the optical uh, transitions at the absorption edge. So uh, the very flat bands that you can see everywhere here, these are the rare earth for F states, of course. Then the, the not so flat bands here in the conduction band, especially this single flat, this single band coming down here, these are rare earth 5D states. And then the bands here in the upper valence band, uh, they are the sulfur 3P states. So the optical transitions at the absorption edge, they are from the sulfur P states to this uh, rare earth D band, which strongly hybridizes with the rare earth F states. So this is for prosodinium fluorosulfide. As you can see for neodymium, it's very similar scenario, but then for samarium, uh, it is different. So in samarium, we have clear PF transitions because here the D band is, is lying higher. And it's again different for gadolinium fluorosulfide, which has a half filled um, four F shell. So the four F states, they are rather far away from the Fermi level. So they don't play any role in the optical transitions. So we have a pure, PD optical gap in gadolinium fluorosulfide. And here, finally, you can see the calculated uh, optical conductivities. Uh, so the different colors, red and blue, and blue, they refer uh, to different light polarizations because these materials, they have a tetragonal crystal structure. So the optical response is different depending on if we shine light polarized parallel to the Z direction or per perpendicularly. And what I found is that from this anisotropic optical response, one can basically identify which uh, states are involved in the optical transitions. So if we compare uh, samarium fluorosulfide and gadolinium fluorosulfide, so in samarium fluorosulfide, um, we have seen we have this clear PF optical transitions, which apparently they contribute uh, equally in for both light polarizations, so blue and red here. While uh, for the PD transitions in gadolinium, uh, it's very different. So they contribute mainly or almost only in the 100 direction. So this would be basically uh, represent a method to identify the, the nature of the optical transition from a polarization uh, resolved measurement of the optical conductivity. But of course, this would uh, require um, good uh, single crystals, which are not uh, available at the moment. So for the moment, this remains a theoretical prediction. Yeah, and if you are interested in any details, uh, it will be, will be published in, or you can of course ask questions afterwards and they will, the details will also be published in this uh, forthcoming publication. And this brings me uh, to the second application that I wanted to show. 
which is also on rare earth compounds and it's on rare earth permanent magnets. And the motivation uh, for, for this investigation is a rather practical one. So as you might know, the, as you might know, the interest, the demand for rare earth permanent magnets is currently very high since they're used, for example, in the engines of electric and hybrid cars. And uh, the, currently the best permanent magnet is uh, this neodymium iron boron magnet in the 241 phase. And this is a very good permanent magnet with high magnetization and high magnet uniaxial magnetic anisotropy. Uh, but uh, in addition to neodymium, also small amounts of uh, heavy rare earth elements like terbium and dysprosium need to be used to increase the heat stability. And especially these heavy rare earth elements, they are very rare and very expensive. So one would like to replace them with more available elements like cerium. And this is the approach that I'm following in this study here. So the target materials that I have been investigating are uh, cerium iron intermetallics in the 112 phase that you can see here. So it's a tetragonal crystal structure. The, the green spheres, they represent the cerium. Then we have uh, the iron in brown. And in order, in experiment to thermodynamically stabilize the compound, uh, some iron sites need to be replaced with titanium. And then the small, um, the small uh, gray uh, spheres here, they represent uh, possible nitrogen interstitials. And one of the main challenges uh, when uh, doing first principles calculations for these compounds is the condo effect in the cerium 4F shell. And here I have like a very uh, simplified sketch of the condo effect, which is a many body effect that can also not be captured in DFT only. So here the, the blue arrow represents the impurity spin. So in our case, the, the cerium spin and the red arrow represents the conduction electron spin. And at high temperature, the conduction electrons, they are very mobile and they couple only weak, weakly to the impurity spin. However, at lower temperature, the conduction electrons, they can couple more strongly to the impurity spin and, found, uh, and form a bound state, a so-called condo singlet state. And as you can clearly see, the net magnetization of the state is, is zero. So the condo effect can have like quite crucial effect on the magnetic properties in correlated uh, compounds. And we, of course, want to know if uh, the cerium magnetic moment in our compounds is condo spinned. And this brings me uh, already to the results. So what you can see here is the cerium magnetic moment, depending on temperature, different colors, uh, they refer to different compounds. So uh, in black, it's this hypothetical theoretical compound, cerium iron 12. Then in red, we have uh, cerium iron 11 titanium and in blue, uh, nitrogenated cerium iron 11 titanium. And uh, in the figure, we have uh, lines and symbols and the lines, they refer to a quasi-atomic approximation to a quasi-atomic picture, uh, which basically means everything uh, beside condo. So we have in this quasi-atomic picture, we have the cerium spin, which is aligned anti-parallel in the exchange field of iron. And we have, uh, we have uh, crystal fields and spin orbit coupling on, this, on the cerium for f -shell. And the main trend, clear trend that we can see in this quasi-atomic picture is decrease of the cerium magnetic moment with temperature. And this basically reflects um, a Curie-wise behavior of the serial magnetic moment in the exchange field of iron. And then the symbols, they are basically our final result with the condo effect included. So now we have uh, like a conduction electron cloud that can screen the serial magnetic moment. And you can see that this actually happens. So uh, the, the difference, so the value here, the symbols, they are quite lower than the, than the lines, the curves here. And most in or interestingly, the condo screening is the most effective in the nitrogenated compound. So this is this uh, uh, represented by the, by the blue triangles here. 
Yeah, so this is the for the so much for the serial magnetic moment. But what I eventually want to calculate is the serial contribution to the magnetic anisotropy. Because in a good permanent magnet, we don't only need a high magnetization, but we also need a high uniaxial magnetic anisotropy, which means that the magnetization sticks in a certain crystallographic direction, the so-called easy axis. And in our compounds, this easy axis is parallel to the Z axis of the crystal. And then the anisotropy energy basically tells you how much energy is needed to push the magnetization out of this easy axis direction. And in a first approximation, this anisotropy energy can be written as an anisotropy constant K1 times sine squared theta, and theta is, is the angle here. And in the quasi-atomic picture, we can calculate the magnetic anisotropy energy uh, depending on the angle theta, you can simply calculate it numerically by a exact diagonalization of the Hamiltonian. And here is what, is what we get, so for three different temperatures. And then by performing a sine square fit, we can extract the K1, the K1 in this quasi-atomic picture without the Congo effect. But then of course, we would like to know it with the Congo effect included. And there we cannot yet do direct uh, calculations. So what we did, we developed a variational approach, an alternative approach, which links the condo screening of the magnetic moment, which is something that we can calculate to the reduction of the anisotropy. And in this variational approach, we simply assume the ground state to be variational wave function, a linear combination of a condo singlet wave function, which is this psi s here, and uh, the psi j is the ma magnetic ground state without, without condo. And alpha is the variational coefficient. And then if one does the derivation, one finds that this coefficient alpha, or basically alpha squared, scales the anisotropy energy, as you can see here. And at, at the same time, it also scales the angular momentum and with that, the magnetic moment. And that is something that we can, that we can easily calculate in DMFT. So this alpha squared is basically the ratio between the magnetic moment uh, with the condo screening included to the magnetic moment without the condo screening. And this we can extract uh, basically from this plot that I've shown before. It's simply the ratio between the symbols and the lines. So here we can extract the alpha, alpha squared. Then the K1 in the atomic picture, we can calculate as we have seen here. And then we can use this formula that we have derived from our variational approach. So the, the, what is left is simply this delta, and this is small, simply a small correction due to the variation of the direction of the exchange field. And like this, we can calculate, finally calculate the K1, which represents the serum anisotropy with, in the presence of combo screen. I know you have five minutes of talking time left. Okay, yeah, I have only one, one slide left. Yes, yeah, so we, can, we have calculated, we can calculate the, the anisotropy of the serum from first principles, but in order to, to compare, to experiment, one still needs to add uh, the iron contribution to the anisotropy, but we did not aim at also uh, calculating the iron contribution. So we simply took it uh, from, exp from experiment, from measurements um, on yttrium iron 11 titanium from this reference here. So from that, we can extract uh, the K1 of iron. So we add the iron K1 uh, to the cerium K1, and then we simply need to divide by the total magnetic moment in order to get uh, the anisotropy field, which is measured in experiment. And here you can see our final result, which is basically the, the anisotropy field depending on, on temperature. So in red, it is for cerium iron 11 titanium, and in blue, it is for nitrogenated cerium iron 11 titanium. And the lines points, they represent uh, my theoretical calculations, while the, the symbols, here and also for the nitrogenated compound, they represent measurements uh, by our experimental project partners from the Theo Darmstadt, which is the group of uh, Oliver Gutfleisch from Theo Darmstadt. 
And as you can see from the plot here, they agree uh, uh, pretty well, I would say, especially in, in experiment, they also see at low temperature, this reduction, clear reduction of the magnetic uh, anisotropy upon uh, nitrogenation. Yeah, and so for further details, I refer to this uh, recent publication. And with this, I would like to conclude. I would like to thank my collaborators, especially uh, Leonid Borowski and Silke Biermann uh, from Ecole Polytechnique in Paris, and also my experimental collaborators from Theo Darmstadt and from ICMCB Bordeaux. And thank you for your attention. <laughs>